clear. Go! How's it hanging dudes? My name is Sean and welcome back to Brutal Games in another Cyberpunk 2077 video. I'll keep this introduction very brief because I know you are here for the documentary. Uh, I do hope you enjoyed the, uh, the title crawl. Uh, this is part two of the timeline of Cyberpunk. In the previous installment we learned about the accidental meteoric rise of the new versatile genre and how the, that jolt to fame allowed the mass populace to manipulate the genre in a tropish fashion, ushering in cyberpunk's dark age. I highly recommend watching part one, Birth of a Genre, to fully grasp the overarching story and meaning of what this series is documenting. Also, if you think I've earned it, uh, then by the end of the video I would appreciate it if you left a like um, and press the sub button. I'll keep you pumping out this content and um, it really does help. So anyway, on with the show. The genre of cyberpunk and its loyal fanbase are massive and unwavering. Yet, as we have discussed, even something so huge as this had a waxing and a waning of popularity. By the mid-90s, audiences had grown tired of the countless iterations of overly sarcastic films and stories. It turned the genre into a trope, relegating it to a niche market. In the meantime, the apocalypse genre had taken a hold and a large portion of the normative populace, including a large minority of the sci-fi fanbase, was completely captivated. It truly was a dark age for the cyberpunk genre. There was one, however, one franchise that endured. And when we say endure, we, we mean it that it stayed alive in a well, not just survived through the times. Yes, other cyberpunk franchises like Blade Runner um, still had loyal fans. However, books and movies are sparse to encounter and don't leave the genre fresh in your mind on a routine basis. In essence, they weren't games. And again, when we say endure, we mean fans were active participants. We are obviously talking about none other than Cyberpunk 2020, the tabletop pen and paper role playing game by R. Telsorian Games and written and created by Mr. Mike Pondsmith himself. The Dark Age was almost over and the genre's golden age long past, but there was that one tiny star shining within the void, ready to leap into a golden age of its own. And this is where we continue our story. Mike Pondsmith was around 20 years old when he made what would become his first commercial game, Mechton, inspired by Japanese comic Mobile Suit Gundam. He made it by using the typesetting uh, machine at the University of California where he was working. Then he took Mechton to a conference nearby to try it out. Six people played the first day, but 40 people turned up the next, and they wanted to know when they could buy it. Pondsmith borrowed $500 from his mom in 1982 to start uh, Artel Swinging Games and fulfill their wishes. It only grew in popularity while Blade Runner and the other mainstream titles faded away from the subculture and fans flocked to Pondsmith's creation and it thrived. Cyberpunk was the 1980s. The bottled excitement of where all the rapidly evolving technology, mobile phones, and personal computers would lead mixed with a blaring screech of punky nonconformity. The game of big guns, rock and roll, drugs, and craziness. All the bad things you're supposed to not do in role playing games. Not supposed to rob, not supposed to steal, not supposed to bust into a building and say, Give me all your cyberware and all your chips. But you can do that in Cyberpunk. That's a quote from Mike Pondsmith. He gave the people a wonderful opportunity to do bad things. I figured it would do well, he says, but I didn't expect I would be riding a cultural wave. It sold just ridiculously. It was a life changing release. A cultural wave that had been starved for immersive content up till this point. The success of Cyberpunk released in 1988 and moved R. Games out of Pondsmith's house and into a proper office, and would dominate the company's output for years. Producing numerous supplements as well as a second edition, Cyberpunk 2020 and 1990, at this time R. Games was a number one contender to the unmatched Dungeons and Dragons.
So far, life was good for Mike, and his creation put him on the map, and awarded him the ability to now settle into his day job at Microsoft, where he kept on with the games. Then, in 2012, in the midst of an R-Tale story on games reformation, the phone rang. It was a call from Poland, from the Witcher studio CD Projekt Red. CDPR drops out of the sky and says, Hello, we're a bunch of guys from Poland, and we want to do cyberpunk. The genre's history was about to leap forward once again. He was sent the Witcher 2 Assassins of Kings as a kind of convincer and Holy crap, he thought it was great, but he was also skeptical. It wasn't the first time someone had asked to do a cyberpunk video game. It's been pretty much under license since its inception, he says, and several major publishers had had a shot. The closest it came was contract negotiations, but the problem was they wanted to change almost everything involved, and so the negotiations fell apart. This is the exact reason CDPR was wanting to do the job. This began sowing the seeds of immersion from start to finish, proving to Mike that the love of the game and the duty to do right by the genre was in the studio's heart. Not to mention, six studio members were playing 2020 as active fans and participants. What impressed Mike most, though, was how much CD Projekt Red knew about Cyberpunk. They knew more about a lot of the things we did in the original Cyberpunk game, and than anybody we'd ever talked to. There were points where I was going, I had forgotten that. And I wrote the damn thing. I realized these guys are fans. They loved it because they had grown up playing it. Nobody had really looked at it from that standpoint before. And there's also an interview where Mike Pondsmith doubles down on the story. So please, don't take my word for it. Roll the clip. They basically, when they finished doing Witcher, Witcher 2, they said, okay, uh, what are we going to do with this? said, we should do science fiction. We have to have a lot of fantasy. And somebody said, we should do cyberpunk. And all these guys who had been in the game said, yeah, all right. So they called us up out of left field. And I, at that point, had been working at Microsoft. And one of my jobs was going over to places way the heck around the world, including what had been the old, at that point, ex-Soviet block, where we would look at studios. And so I'm here, okay, a bunch of guys, CD Projekt, and they're in Warsaw. And I'm imagining like 10 guys crammed in a room with like antiquated computers, you know, on a goat. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they're really hard working, but, you know, I had been to, I'd actually gone to studios like that, it minus the goat. <laughs> so I assumed that, you know, it's going to be all oh, these guys can't do this. And then they sent us a copy of Witcher 2, and we went, well, this is pretty good. They're going to really get programmed. <laughs> <laughs> so they go, well, we want you to come out and, you know, we'll talk about it, you know, and see if we can do this. So I go, hey, we took the pole. I've never been there before. Why not? You know, and I got over there and I went, wow, these guys had a studio better than most of the ones I've worked in at Microsoft. And I walked around there. And remember, this is my job. I walk around just looking at studios and find where they do things and, you know, managing that end of it. And I'm going, these guys have their shit together. So we came back to it and went, wow, we looked out. These guys look like they can do it. And when I walked in the first day at the studio, I went, oh yeah, we have to tell you, like, we're going to have these characters here. We have to put Johnny Silverhand in, and we have to put these people in. And all that I said, they know more about this than I probably remember. <laughs> so, you know, I've got to go back and borrow up on my books here. <laughs> There's a, yeah, there's a whole host of stuff that we, we can't talk about, but hopefully you can tell us how it, it came about in the first place. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a great one, I can tell it. Um, okay, so jump back to 90s, and we're doing Cyberpunk. We licensed it in a lot of different languages. And this guy comes to us, he and his wife, and they want to license Cyberpunk in Polish. Polish. Okay, now remember, this is the Iron Curtain is still up. This is solidarity is beginning to get popular. Okay, so we're looking at, you know, whoever reads this is probably going to end up in a secret police jail somewhere or something. And I remember looking over at my business manager, who's also my wife, and I said, well, Polish, we'll sell about five copies. Okay. Uh, I think we sold those five copies to the guys who were part of CD Project Red because they were teenagers and college guys, and they, as one of them told me years later, we had communism and we had cyberpunk. I said, thank you for choosing cyberpunk. So yes, at the end of the day, CD Projekt Red, they were true fans, creating an immersive game for wholesome intentions, all while having a gridless heart. 
a new generation of cyberpunk fans had already been cultivating in other facets of entertainment. The stars had finally aligned and the golden age had begun. Alright guys, that's part two of the timeline of cyberpunk. We will be wrapping it up in the third and final installment and um, I want to keep that sort of a secret, but it's probably just going to be um, CDPR and how they're taking over the world with um, their greedless antics, right? <laughs> so, so please let me know what you guys think, head down that comment section below, type your heart away, give me all the uh, critiques I can possibly get to make this last part better, and of course whenever I upload all three as one full documentary, I will try to do as much editing and as much fixing as I possibly can. I'm really excited to get this done, and I hope you guys do enjoy this. And if you stand in the middle of the street playing chicken with cars, make sure you smash that like and subscribe if you're new, and until next time, piss off. To the one, five, one, two, three. I like good pussy and I like good trees. Smoke so much weed, you up and believe. And I get more ass than a toilet seat. Three to the one, five, one, two, three. I met a bad bitch last night in the deep. Let me tell you how I'm gonna leave with me. Conversation and his